Um, I want to introduce our third and final speaker of the series, Dan Michelson. Dan Michelson is a founding partner, creative director, and technical lead at Linked by Air. Prior to founding Linked by Air, Dan was a designer at 2x4 and Pentagram. He holds an MFA degree in graphic design from Yale School of Art and a degree in American history from Columbia University. Dan teaches the interaction design and thesis studio courses in Yale's graduate uh, graduate graphic design department. Linked by Air is a designer of the Columbia GSAP and Yale School of Art website. The popular drawing app Shrub and the websites of the Whitney Museum, Museo Jumex, uh, Printed Matter, ICA LA, and other cultural institutions. So I know that um, we've all been very excited about the launch of the GSAP website that you, you know, know and love and reference every day. Um, so we'll get to hear a little bit more about the, the kind of the story behind how that came to be. Um, Dan Studio is also working on the new website for Yale School of Art, um, which he won't show, but it's actually launching in February. So look, at, look out for that project as well. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks. Uh, so I wanted to sort of talk about um, uh, living archives today in a few different ways. And um, our studio does a lot of work, um, as Yunjie mentioned, with museums and cultural institutions, um, uh, schools like this one, and the Yale School of Architecture and the Yale School of Art. Um, and so a lot of our work in a number of different ways sort of deals with, um, with creating archives, um, whether it's a, a, a permanent collection of art at a museum or, um, or uh, things that students make at a school or the courses at a school. Um, and, and at the same time, we're really invested in thinking about um, time and, and so, when you think about an archive, it's both a, um, uh, a database set of things, but it's also something that's growing over time and that, that represents a, a history, a, a moving um, a needle across an axis of time. Um, I'm going to start. One way that I sometimes illustrate this idea uh, is, is here in the, at the International Space Station. This is certainly not our work. Um, the scaphander. Uh, tether from the BU. Uh, the radio scaph. Okay, I understand. We unsecure it uh, from the suit and then we attach the uh, the tether remains on the BU. That's correct. You leave the tether. I understand. Valery? Uh, you have to try and uh, push it at, at least half a meter per second uh, against the um, motion. Valery, you can release uh, the uh, tether and you can secure the tether on the station. We're getting the picture. All right. Goodbye. Mr. Smith, yeah, we can see. And there was the uh, deployment of Suitset flying away. Uh, we can At 5.02 p.m. Central Time, Suitset on its way, heading into an innovative and solitary orbit around the Earth. Yeah, it's uh, moving at the specified acceleration. We can see uh, this satellite from the ground. Wonderful picture, Valeri. Thank you very much. Suitsat having been deployed over the uh, South Central Pacific Ocean at 5.02 p.m. Central Time. Valery? Bill? Yeah. Go ahead. A scene reminiscent of science fiction movies that have depicted stranded astronauts floating away from their spacecraft. Suitsat begins its journey 
filled with ham radio equipment to transmit messages and slow scan digital TV pictures to ham enthusiasts and students around the world. The uh, trajectory operations officer here in Mission Control reports a good deploy within the cone uh, for safety to ensure no recontact with the International Space Station. Um, so it's kind of very elaborate joke in a way, this, this really low budget satellite um, built from an empty space suit. Um, and you can sort of hear how difficult it was and even how um, some level of danger in the exertion that these astronauts are, are um, working through to, to push this thing safely out of the, um, out of the airlock. This is CubeSat-1, amateur radio station, RS0RS. Oh, the Jordan, oh, the... Oh, the bomb. This is Evan, the Cubie. This new satellite... So, um... Suitset contained uh, broadcasting equipment, and it broadcast a radio signal um, as it orbited the Earth. And that contained greetings in, in many languages, and um, uh, like telemetry information, you know, the, the state of its own battery and its temperature. Um, And as people on Earth uh, observed or these, these radio transmissions overhead, they would contribute them um, to uh, this online map so that this kind of trajectory of motion and this sort of elaborate science fiction vignette uh, are turned into a map um, and a database, an archive of observations. Um, one of the things I really like about um, uh, Sutset's kind of grammar uh, is that, that that static that you can hear going in and out um, in those audio recordings is a, 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 a trace of Sutset tumbling head over heels. So you can sort of, you can hear this um, human body kind of flipping over and over and over as it orbits the Earth, um, as the antenna points towards the Earth and point toward, points away from the Earth. Um, you get different inflections in its voice. And to some extent, those are captured in this database, in this map, and, and to some extent, not so much. And of course, these observations can be represented in different ways, as a map, as a database, and the qualities are also recorded as well. What you heard and how it sounded. So one of the things I'm going to be sort of coming back to a few times is sort of the relationship between um, uh, things that you experience in the moment, um, like an act of speech or something that's tumbling head over heels or something that feels nostalgic or like sci-fi, um, and trying to capture those things into, into a database, into an archive, and an archive that's always growing. Um, sort of take a step back and start at the beginning for Linked by Air. This was our first uh, studio at the moment when we moved in on, on East Broadway in the Lower East, or Chinatown. Um, and uh, that's my partner, Tamara. Um, this was in 2005. Um, out the window, we really liked sort of all the movement on East Broadway. It's kind of one of the most amazing streets in, in Manhattan. And I've always liked this, this sort of uh, early photo from our own archive um, of sort of information moving by, um, kind of on the network uh, of New York streets. Um, one of our first projects uh, that we worked on as a studio was the website for the Yale School of Art. Um, and we, one thing that, I, and I'm sort of also thinking about you guys as, as architects and students who are working on a body of work, working on an approach to practice, and also maybe thinking about a portfolio. How do you represent that work? And is that a finished thing now, or is it continually growing and evolving? Um, and like you do with respect to your own work, we had a very um, intimate and first, per first person perspective on the School of Art when we were asked to work on this website. We had been students there. Um, I was on the faculty there at the time, and I still am. 
And, um, and so we knew that that was a place that like GSAP is changing every day. There's always new work in the halls, the studios are always different, the students moving through are always new. And so there should be a website that also was as dynamic as that and changed all the time. Um, unlike, uh, unlike GSAP, there was no communication staff um, at the School of Art, it's a much smaller school. And, um, and so it would be sort of impossible to engineer a website that would be different every day um, unless we realized we exploited the students um, who were super talented and creative people um, to change the website all the time. So we proposed to the administration that, um, that we would uh, build a system that allowed all the students, staff, and faculty at the school to edit every page of the site and to add new pages um, all the time. Um, one of the ways we sort of incentivized students to do that was by putting the calendar really prominently on the homepage. And um, uh, to some extent, that's a quality of GSAP's site as well, um, so that students who are trying to want to know what's happening at the school um, will make this page their homepage. It will come back to it all the time. Then we'll be dissatisfied with it and we'll want to improve it. Um, by now, um, uh, so tw uh, 12 years later, the site is still running. It's, um, uh, it's gone through lots of crazy phases. Um, uh, uh, it's um, consists of 3,700 pages by now. Um, there are 51,000 uh, versions of those pages that have been worked on by 828 different students, staff, and faculty. Um, the homepage alone has been edited um, 7,400 times. Um, and against that, um, about three and a half million different people have viewed um, those pages 19 million times. Um, so it's a substantial archive now of, uh, of one axis of production by, um, by uh, really talented um, student artists. Um, the, and it's still growing, um, and it's still in flux, and, and, um, and it, still feels, it still feels new. Um, the way that we made this possible was by designing a, a grammar, a, a kit of parts. Um, and it was important that uh, the system that you would use to edit the site be easy enough for students to use without any training. Um, and also that it be modular partly for ease of use and so that the design wouldn't totally break um, as different people used it. Um, but also so that we could um, protect parts of pages. So we, we wanted students to be able to edit the uh, admissions pages. We could not let students change the tuition or change faculty bios. So, um, so we sort of thought about it um, as making sure that there were no locked doors in the site, but that there could be locked uh, file cabinets. And that's sort of a part of being a responsible um, institution or organization. Um, so these are sort of some, some drawings actually of the, of the grammar of this site. Uh, in a sense, if you, I sort of see this as analogous to uh, the grammar of that suit set sort of tumbling head over heels in a way. These are the, these are the, um, the parts of speech um, for the Yale School of Art site as it has grown over 12 years and, and, and been sort of recorded and used by lots of people during that time. So these pieces can be rearranged um, in any order. Um, on all pages. And this is the content management system that we developed um, at Linked by Air to make this possible. This system is called Economy um, because it's a sort of uh, platform for exchange or a, a system that, um, uh, that, 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 that grows and deals in the trade of information. Um, to make a page in Economy, you can start, you sort of start with a blank slate, you click in the crack, choose what kind of content you want to make, and you sort of saw what those modules look like for the School of Art. They look different for GSAP, um, and you have a different choices at GSAP than the School of Art has. That choice leads to questions, like what's the title and what's the content of this text module? Um, you can, or what's the image and what's the caption in this image module? You can then sort of click in the crack between two more things, keep inserting content, rearrange it, and so on. Um, 
these were the pages that uh, the school launched with. And one way that you can also get a sense of the sort of quality of time going by is in the, the, uh, the browser Chrome of these very professional screenshots. So this, in a sense, is what the site was meant to look, by, look like. Uh, these pages were built by, by us. Feature of it that's sort of forgotten for a number of reasons, I mean, this is a weird tangent, but um, is uh, this stripe that goes down the middle. Um, and students can edit the background of, the, of every page and can say, what do they want this part to be? What do they want this part to be? And what do they want the stripe to be? But they can't move the stripe. And they could make the stripe not be there, but if it's there, this is where it is. And you could change what color that is or what pattern is in the stripe, but you can't move it. Um, and so that's the sort of very loose visual identity that's, that's, that's on the site in a way. That kind of got lost over the years. And I always thought that it was because um, we sort of weren't teaching students how to use it. And so nobody was sort of populating that, that, that part of the background module as the years went by. Um, it turned out that there was a CSS bug, actually. So over the years, um, browsers no longer rendered it successfully. So we, we brought it back recently. But it's actually sort of an interesting example of how um, culture and technology sort of intertwine to create um, uh, change, both intentional and unintentional, over the years. Um, these are pages that were built uh, after the launch, in the 12 years after the launch. Lots of home pages. faculty pages. Um, this system sort of functions as groupware, so students can collaborate through the site to work on projects together. For a period of time, students tended to sort of launch quasi-official um, uh, bureaus of the school. Uh, the Department of Anthology was a bootleg film series. Um, a number of students kind of started office hours. A uh, really successful and great um, game design class was started uh, just through the website when a, uh, Jeffrey Scudder just gave it a course number. Um, student pages. Sometimes the site, in a way, is a surface for art on its own, in a sense, rather than a, or it functions. Um, I can uh, as a uh, as a documentation or a portfolio of art. Um, of course, lots of things can go wrong with a system like that. Um, uh, one day, the um, uh, the site was down, and um, and as we tracked down the reason why it was down, it was because it had been nominated as the. Um, suckiest website of the year 2010 on um, websites that suck.com. And, and by then it also won awards for, for great graphic design as well. Um, and uh, um, so we, and then uh, as a result it was featured on Reddit, the traffic crashed the site. We had to explain that to the administration. They took it super well. And, and um, uh, but there's a great thread on Reddit. Um, I'll bet Yale's art department has an awesome looking site, wait, what? Uh, and at some point, um, someone points out, hey, it's a wiki that, you know, the site changes all the time. It's not, it's not bad design, it's, it's bad content. And, um, uh, and the response um, is a really useful one. Now we know that's not a good idea. And, um, uh, and it's true that you know that we try to design for for outcomes in a way. We're trying to set a system in motion that hopefully will be healthy over the years, um, and and you can judge it either by the system that we release or by the kit of parts or by how it turns out. Um, I do think it was a good idea. It's uh, for 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 what it's worth. It's um, it's the site um, is sometimes great, sometimes bad. It often looks like. Um, the work of the students at the School of Art, who presumably, which presumably many commentators on Reddit also would not like. Um, uh, but um, you know, we just went through 
uh, admissions at Yale, and it's not uncommon for people to say that they you know, applied to the school because of the website, um, or that that was, um, uh, immediately they knew what kind of place um, it was. Um, so this content management system, um, we use subsequently for many other institutions. Um, uh, here's a snapshot of GSAP, and you can see how it also forms a kind of database of pages, right? Um, and one of the things it does is track um, trends in viewership. Um, these are some of the other sites we've built with it. Uh, Printed Matters website, the, the artist bookstore. Uh, Tang Museum, the Manil Collection, the Aspen Art Museum. the Whitney Museum. And in sort of showing this real, one of the things we like to focus on is context, in a sense. And so that um, we're sort of creating a set of possibilities, but authors and institutions are going to um, um, activate those possibilities based on their own, their own context and what their own environments are like and what's happening at the school or at the museum from, from week to week. Um, as a design process, sort of immersing ourselves in those contexts at the beginning of a project is a really important part of our process to understand what a place is like so that we can develop a language that's appropriate to that place. Um, another living archive uh, from a similar period for us was, uh, this was the um, graduating exhibition of the uh, graphic design students at the Yale School of Art in 2006, and I was, I was teaching the class in that year. And in that year, um, students uh, decided to represent all of their work as eight and a half by 11 inch color printouts. Um, and so it made this kind of really spectacular space um, in this huge gallery cube. Uh, and to do that, they started with what you could call a database or a model, um, a very sophisticated uh, arch architectural maquette. And, um, uh, and the, there was sort of simple math involved. There, we could count the number of pixels that were in the space um, and divide it by 18 students. Each student then had a particular number of pixels, and they could decide how, what, how they, what the disposition of those pixels should be. So if one student's work related in, thematically to another student's work, maybe they would situate themselves next to each other or comb into each other. Um, some students made sort of one grand gesture in one area of the space. Other students kind of distributed themselves like uh, salt all around the space. Um, and so that sort of process of negotiation um, needs a database like this one in the sense it needs a way to sort of plan from the top down where everything goes. But at the same time, that exhibition is a time-based process, so we had uh, five days to mount it, and so there's also math involved in figuring out um, how much of, this, of the gallery would we be able to cover in that time, and also what did our, how much could our tiny budget um, afford. And so there are actually three rooms um, in the art school's uh, gallery. And so we timed um, sort of how fast this, uh, this printer is, this gantry that we built that um, moves across the walls as someone stands on top and puts the sheets of paper up with shiny sticky tape. Um, and from that, we knew that we could cover that entire huge bottom space and also the middle level, which we turned into a, a paper movie theater which students turned into a paper movie theater. It's actually sort of a really slow space, and it was an actually a sort of a really slow space in a funny way. When you sort of looked at it from, uh, from above, it's this kind of huge gesture, but when you were in it, there's so much detail um, that you really kind of got lost in it. Um, but we knew from the beginning that we did not uh, have the time um, to cover the upper level, and so instead that was a huge sign that said welcome and pointed you down the stairs. And of course, once you set up a system like that, um, just like with the School of Art website, 
the rest of the choices sort of make themselves. So how do you make the sign? Of course, you make it out of paper, which is then naturally backlit from, from inside. Um, so uh, it, in the very, in the front uh, sort of antechamber, um, the hero of the exhibition. So we used that same CMS to build the Whitney's website um, a few years later. And uh, you can sort of see how that system is built of these same kinds of modules as the School of Art website, even though the, the modules themselves are different. Um, and our, our thought was that the, the Whitney engages in lots of different kinds of activities, which is sort of underappreciated, um, that it both has a great permanent collection and great contemporary exhibitions, um, but also really good educational programming and, and um, uh, for adults and for kids, for example. Um, and so we built a system that would allow um, uh, like 50 different staff at the Whitney to sort of rearrange that story um, from week to week and month to month and year to year. Um, uh, that website was white in the day and black at night. And at the moment of sunset, New York City time, um, we got the Whitney to commission a series of, of artist interventions, one per season, that would that would be the sunset, and so everybody on the site at that time would see the transition for 30 seconds as as depicted by a, a different artist every season. And um, uh, so, like with the suit set, um, the Whitney's website is this kind of collection of rearranged modules that's changing all the time, um, but it's also observed at particular times. And what's really nice about seeing the sunset, and that's something that you can still do, actually, if you go to Whitney.org um, at the moment of, of astronomical sunset in New York City, um, you will see something cool for 30 seconds, and you realize at that time, A, I should like look out the window, it actually is sunset, and B, and, or like stop programming for a second in my case, um, and B, um, uh, everybody else is seeing this too. So using the web can be this kind of solitary experience, but at this moment you realize that there's other people doing the same thing. Um, this also happens in New York City time to emphasize the Whitney as a New York institution. So if you're looking at the site from, um, from another time zone uh, or from overseas, you, you kind of get a sense of the rhythm um, of our city. Here you see sort of the homepage as it usually was. Uh, one day we checked out the site and the Whitney's designers, uh, the Whitney's in-house team had used our system to sort of radically redesign the homepage in preparation for the biennial using this kind of set, this system of tools that we had given them. Um, just like with the School of Art, we were really interested in sort of how the system was being used by its, by its authors. And of course with the Whitney, it's not editable by everybody in the world, it's editable just by staff. And, um, uh, and so we sort of figured out how to get this kind of 30,000 foot view of, of how the system uh, grew. So I believe this is before the launch. This is us and Whitney staff working on pages, populating the database, arranging modules, starting from one page at the beginning, the login page, through the launch at this particular moment, which is like a minor moment. And then the site continues to evolve and iterate for the years after that. Um, and just like your work does. Um, sort of another layer of change in 2013, um, the Whitney moved from its uptown location to its new location, its current location in the Meatpacking District, um, got a new graphic identity, and, um, and so we had a chance to redesign the site again uh, four years later. And that was a really cool um, opportunity because by now we knew how the site had been used. Um, we knew what was in the database. Um, uh, one example I like to talk about is that we had, um, in the 2009 version of the site, launched a feature that allowed all users to make their own collections of artwork on the site, another kind of living archive. But that, and that feature was somewhat popular, but what you could not do was see other people's collections. You could only see your own. Um, and you could share them on Facebook, but there wasn't an area of the site where you could browse um, sort of crowdsourced collections. Um, by 2013, 
uh, the Whitney's attitudes had loosened up a little bit, and also we were able to look in the database and realize that, uh, some, that the collections that had been made were reasonably interesting. Whereas in 2009, that would have been a leap of faith because we were just launching the system. Um, and so uh, when we relaunched in 2013, we were able to sort of activate that feature more fully. So it's a much different looking site, but still built on the same CMS and now with an expanded database rather than starting from zero. Um, I'll talk about the, the, I'll talk about GSAP's site and then start to wrap up. Um, so when we started to work with GSAP, um, I'll talk about, I want to talk about sort of some of the things that we first identified as, as being qualities that we wanted to represent. Um, we saw the new site as a kind of exposure machine that in the same way that when you are in the building or near the building, you can see what is happening um, uh, this week, um, that the website should, should make that clear and transparent as well to current students and to prospective students. Um, we also saw the website as a connection machine um, that we would we built a database uh, that relates content at GSAP in an interconnected way that shows that content dynamically as it comes and goes over time um, and that shows it reciprocally so that you can get from a faculty page to the courses they have taught um, to sample work made in those courses and then all the way back. Um, so in a way that sort of set of connections is the life of GSAP. Um, programs have courses, courses have faculty members, courses also have work, work is made by students. And so our database sort of models all of that, um, kind of like the paper model of the School of Art exhibition that we looked at. Um, and it's not really uh, these sort of one-way flows. Everything can potentially relate to everything else. Students can be associated with a publication. Um, the access of time is related to everything on the site. Um, and so uh, that sort of quality of interconnection was sort of part of GSEP's um, brand identity for us. Um, and thirdly, we saw the site as a kind of um, uh, an ecosystem machine. Um, the, the previous dean um, had sort of described GSEP as a network and as a cloud. We wanted to start to focus a little bit more on the local, even on the planetary, um, uh, and not just in the sense of flows of data, but also in the sense of the importance of the contexts in which you guys make work and the context in which you cite work, um, as well as the specificities of local audiences um, and uh, the way um, architecture is used and experienced and displayed in all the spaces of GSAP, like this one. Um, I'm really fond of this photograph. As UJ mentioned, I, uh, I was an undergrad here at Columbia. To me, this is such a New York image and such a Columbia image. Um, uh, layers accumulate of signage, of postings, of models, of, of successive ideas for how space might be used. Right, the same, the floor is indicated in like four, four or five different ways in this photograph. Um, and um, it's, it's plastic, it's a plastic space and a plastic city. Um, uh, and that's even before we sort of add the people, you guys, and how you use the space um, and all the different ways that you use the space. Um, so those three ideas together um, are sort of what went into GSAP's website and also into its identity. Um, this is the, the tote bag. So we, we also designed um, GSAP's identity system, its typeface, its logo. Um, this is, uh, I think, Neil Donnelly's um, tote bag uh, using that system. And so GSAP's typeface exists in four weights, um, morning, afternoon, evening, and night. 
to represent uh, the um, uh, the life of a, the 24-hour life of a student, um, and the importance of of time to to pedagogy and learning. That you're a different person um, uh, two years out than you were when you when you when you um, matricul matriculated. Um, in a sense, the typeface was also inspired by um, Columbia Sundial, that kind of meeting place, um, or vestigial sundial um, uh, at the bottom of the steps. Uh, so the logo casts a type, a shadow, is a shadow. Um, again, to sort of communicate the importance of time to the idea of interconnection to the idea of learning and to the idea of a context and architecture specifically. Um, recently, we've uh, sort of redesigned the earth. That is, the, the earth has been at the bottom of the homepage for a long time. Um, we recently redesigned it to make it a little more engaging. So now, um, as you browse uh, the earth at the bottom of the page or on the new GSEP Global page, which actually just launched um, uh, like a few days ago. Uh, or on Friday, I think. Um, uh, you can see images of GSEP's um, uh, footprint around the world. Um, and we've done some cool uh, mapping. Let's see. This is called a Moloweed projection. Um, so uh, GSEP's geography, its contexts are represented um, uh, as an interrupted map on the GSEP global page and as, a, as an interactive globe on the, um, on the bottom of the homepage. Um, and so these show upcoming events. The ones with green boxes are happening like real soon today. Um, and uh, I believe if the green box is flashing, it's uh, happening within the hour. Um, and here you can get a sense of the sort of interconnectedness also of GSAP's database. So when you click through to these, each of these are real things, whether it's a studio a course or a workshop or an event um, around the world. Um, this also um, corresponds to the campus screens, which we also designed. And you see them around, um, um, around the buildings here in New York. Uh, also meant to sort of interconnect the activities of the different um, programs at GSAP uh, so that you can see one another's work um, and, and see what events are happening. Um, uh, at, and it's the same visual language sort of across all those things with the same idea of a green box, for example, to show a, um, um, a, uh, a near, an, an event which is about to happen um, or, a, or a flashing green box to show uh, like you know, lights are flashing, time to go into the theater. Um, in a way, those screens are kind of clocks. And um, if you, I'm not sure if you notice, but they uh, actually go faster throughout the day and then slower. So they are very zippy uh, in the morning once you've had your coffee. Uh, they begin to slow down um, in the afternoon. They get darker at nighttime. They turn black, like the Whitney's website, and become uh, really slow and almost kind of dreamlike and sometimes abstract. They show different mixtures of content um, at different times of day as well. And they actually do literally show the time and uh, as like literally the time. And um, so uh, again, that's sort of suit set tumbling head over head. That's your first person kind of head up experience um, metaphorically of and kind of literally of life at GSAP, life in an institution as you travel through it. And then we can also represent that. Um, oops, sorry for the. No, we're good. Um, we can also represent that spread out on a map, stored in a database, and it's a database that's always growing um, over time. Um, That same idea about flexibility in a different way um, informed our identity for Columbia Books um, on architecture in the city. So uh, the imprint mark for your publisher um, 
is uh, a placeholder. Um, it's pure potential, um, or it's kind of poche. Um, but its aspect ratio changes depending on the size of the cover. So when you're looking at the spine, you can see what the book, what shape the book is if you take it off the shelf. Um, and the thickness of the lines corresponds to the number of pages in the book. Um, I'm going to sort of skip forward a little bit. We've also, we also work on um, the New Museum's digital archive. That's an archive of sort of 15,000 works um, uh, that launched a couple months ago and um, also has a weird connection to GSAP because it's uh, stored in uh, the GSAP incubator, or it's physically located in the same building as the GSAP incubator. So it's kind of strange to, and literally next door to our office, so it's sort of strange to encounter ourselves there. Um, this is the, what the archive literally looks like. It's sort of mysterious. Um, this is its structure. And um, uh, as a database, as a data structure, it's complicated. And understanding it was a big part of our work. And in some cases, reconfiguring that data structure. Um, and as a design, we designed it as a kind of a publication. So the homepage can change periodically. And so we wanted to represent it not as a database, but almost in the way that we would represent a museum homepage um, with different kinds of content represented in different ways. It's really engaging. Um, this design is meant to sort of evoke the kind of drama of being in the archive, that photo that I just showed, of opening one of those boxes. Um, uh, but it's also sort of a publication in that um, this homepage will be changed um, every couple months. Um, we also work on Printed Matters website, which is an artist bookstore. This database um, has uh, 40,000 works in it. It's a really important. Um, archive of books made by artists uh, and is also, there's, there's like 15,000 books in stock and they're sold on consignment. So our system um, issues payments to like 6,000 artists a year, um, creating this kind of social network of artists. And it's organized around tables, um, just like the store is. Um, so I'll sort of wrap up by uh, talking about our own studio a little bit. Um, we've often been interested in, um, in authoring apps like Economy, the CMS that builds um, all of the sites that I've just shown you. Um, we also have launched a couple of apps of our own, and this one is called Bug. It's an app for kids that turns, um, that turns uh, color into sound uh, so that kids can use it to sort of explore their environments. And these are some trailers that we um, made for Bug. Um, I believe Laurel Schwulst edited these trailers on uh, iMovie on her phone like while riding the subway to and from work. Um, so it's a sort of a mobile application um, uh, communicated using mobile technologies. And um, so, if, you know, of course, this is an app just like Economy, the content management system that is used for sort of making sense or meaning out of your world or translating the context around you into, into a new form, a new kit of parts. Um, and, uh, and we made it because it's also a, um, a, a, a description of our studio's perspective. So in a sense, these trailers are a kind of advertisement or a, as good of an identity for our studio as anything. 
Um, uh, and also at our studio, it helps us to sort of advance and talk about the ideas, um, our own ideas about, uh, about archiving and reconfiguring um, content. Um, this is our studio today. Um, and uh, um, quite recently, and uh, I just to say that sort of, I'm going to end with, with, or end with this slide more or less. Um, uh, this is a uh, a set of T-shirts that Laurel designed for us um, a couple of years ago, and uh, it shows at least up until then most of the current and former staff at Linked by Air, in which and it's a it's a a system in which everybody's shirt depicts somebody else's face and yet again somebody else's name. Um, and so it's a really nice, uh, also a nice image of our studio in that it shows how over the years as different designers and programmers have passed through the studio, they each sort of add their, um, their perspective to the studio. Uh, I think each of them have really been in influenced by the perspective and the approach that the studio already had, but also often um, designers who have worked at Link by Air have, have shifted and pushed that perspective into new um, uh, paths, um, or at least new inflections on, those pa on, 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 the, on the voice that we already had uh, in ways that, that outlast them in ways that uh, often are quite durable even after those designers um, move on in their careers. So our studio practice itself uh, is a kind of an archive that's always evolving and always changing. Uh, it's something that I've sort of learned over the years as we grew from just being me and my, uh, my wife, Tamara, uh, to being a, a giant corporation of, of eight people. Um, so uh, that sense of sort of thinking about um, uh, a perspective or a design practice as being both a database and also a kind of a printer or something that um, that unfolds over time uh, that's a, also as well as a model a way of expressing a perspective on the world um, through an approach that you can articulate um, uh, that's an approach that I think works well for individual designers is a good way to think about your portfolio if you're still thinking about that um, and it's, uh, it's an approach in some ways that, it, that I um, uh, try to teach and model um, with my thesis students uh, at Yale as well. Can we turn the lights on? Okay, we'll take some questions. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, you described designing a content management system that can be used by several different institutions or entities, but is there a sort of check or a way built into that content management system to ensure that one website doesn't look like another's? Yeah. Um, in other words, like if the Whitney were hell-bent on recreating GSAP's website, um, could, like, could they do that using the tool that you've designed? That's a really good question. And it's the same system. They're not, of course, they're not. It's not literally one shared database um, across across these institutions. Each institution is pretty separately, some pretty much separately hosted. Um, uh, although I've often been intrigued about the idea of creating connections between them, um, that idea of difference was in economy from the start. The way that we thought about it is that when we would start working with an institution, there would be no modules. So like GSAP site, a page on GSAP site is a string of a text module, a video module, but also a publications module, a courses module, um, and a slideshow module. And the idea of economy at sort of degree zero is that each institution, when we arrive when we begin working with them, their economy wouldn't have any modules in it. There wouldn't be such a, there wouldn't be such a thing as a text module. So the 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 syntax itself, we would invent for each client. 
meaning um, you know, the Whitney doesn't have a publications module. And several of our clients do have a text module, um, so there are, you know, there's sort of more in common than, than zero, but, um, uh, but also, of course, what each module looks like um, is different. So there's sort of, there's a few different dimensions in which there's a lot of difference between each client. What's the same is um, that idea of rearrangement, the idea that a page can be sort of like DNA, that a page can be represented as like a one-dimensional string of, 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 of parts, uh, of genes. Um, so that, you know, I think if you look at all the sites we've created, you probably can detect that common approach to design. Um, and, you know, I think if you're a practicing architect or a practicing graphic designer, there's going to be something in common with your work across all of your clients. And that's basically a good thing. Um, what economy has wound up doing and kind of what we always meant for it to do was to encode that, encode our studio's approach um, in software while still allowing the flexibility for our approach to change and for us to, to find different solutions for every client. So I think more than most other CMSs, um, it, it, it does allow us to kind of start from scratch with each client, even though there's that sort of shared spine among them. Um, and also, you know, what's in terms of thinking about how our studio evolves over the years and how we get to sort of maintain some continuity but also grow and change, uh, it's been really cool to have this one project that we literally have been working on for 12 years um, that does connect of, across all of our clients. And that's actually been a really interesting way to create connection among different designers and programmers who pass through the studio. And I don't want to make it sound like our studio has um, uh, so much turnover. It, it doesn't. I mean, people tend to stay for, you know, for, for, for several years. But, but, um, uh, but for example, with programmers, when one programmer leaves and another one comes, that um, there's this, this code base, this software, this way of working that's pretty well established that can be passed on from one to the next. And the same thing goes for designers. Um, has really put us on sort of good footing um, to be able to have some, some sustainability as a studio and then also to, to build on that foundation in order to be able to sort of safely shift where we go um, uh, along the way. Thanks. Anyone else? Oh. Right. Uh, I'm curious if one of the things that's interesting about the School of Art website, the Yale School of Art website, is that there's this sort of like polarizing take on it across the internet. And I'm curious, um, it's kind of interesting that you have a, a chance to do it again. And I'm interested if that feedback has informed how you're approaching V2. Um, V2, I think, is going to be a pretty minimal um, uh, uh, upgrade. We, we, our goals at the moment, we're still figuring it out, but our goals at the moment are to uh, make it work on mobile, um, to you know, clean up and re-educate the design a little bit. It's been a while since I've even really talked to students about the site culturally, and so it's a little bit messier than I'd like it to be. Um, even compared to where it was like five years ago. Um, it just needs a little sweep. Um, but um, uh, but I, there's no desire to change the design or change its editability that I've heard of. It's actually sort of, those features are remarkably popular in the administration. Um, in terms of, oh, and the other thing that's really, actually really interesting um, to me, uh, is the issue of accessibility. Um, this is an issue in architecture too, I'm sure. Um, but uh, if you have limited vision or limited dexterity, um, that you can reliably use the website. And um, that's become a bigger and bigger um, uh, priority for, for cultural institutions and schools um, over the last few years, which is great. and you know, the idea of sort of thinking about users and how they're going to perceive a site is really important to our practice, and that means thinking about all users and all the different ways that they're going to physically engage with a site. 
what does that mean when um, when it's like everybody who's contributing the content and students are contributing animated GIFs that that could be a problem for somebody with epilepsy, um, you know, or that could make it hard to find what you're looking for if your vision is limited, or that you know that could interfere with the um, with color contrast. Um, so that's a really cool question, actually, and um, and it's sort of like a legal and compliance question a little bit and just a, a good values question. Um, so I don't know if we're gonna um, try to use technology to like slow down the animated GIFs or try to use some kind of intelligence to, to uh, ensure accessibility even when the content is user supplied um, or, uh, or what. I mean, in a way the design was always like the navigation on the sidebar of the School of Art site is really dumb in how it's designed. It's so it, it the sort of static parts of the design are meant to um, be visible no matter what else is happening. Um, but so those are some of the things we're gonna be thinking about. In terms of um, its polarizing effect on the internet, uh, and the school does get hate mail like all the time, especially <laughs> since um, especially since it was featured on websites that suck. People, like, it's a it's a popular assignment at like th sort of third rate design schools is to redesign projects from websites that suck. dot com. So we often get like proposals to redesign the site and stuff. Um, and uh, and I actually it's featured on Reddit like frequently. Actually, it turns out this discussion has happened like happens like once a year. But um, uh, but I it's um, I haven't heard anything about that as a as a goal for the redesign, frankly, which is a little bit surprising. It maybe speaks to the School of Arts sort of utter lack of marketing instinct. But you know our approach from the start was that this the site should appeal to current to only to two groups of people: current students and prospective students, people who wanted to be the current students, and um, and if everybody else hates it, um, so what? And if you think about that for about 30 seconds, you realize there are some shortcomings to that approach, but, but um, uh, yeah. As long as we're talking about the suckiest website on the internet, I feel like uh, that, I always felt like it had such a vitality to, ha to have, take this approach and a novelty, but also, you know, gave agency to the students to like participate on the website, which is something that almost no institution, now that it's been up there for uh, 10, 12 years, I, I never see. It's like there were tons of wikis at that time, but it, especially as like the institutional channel uh, doesn't really ha happen. And I wonder if you've ever had the chance to do that again. Would you uh, take that kind of approach where you can turn over keys to users? and let them participate in the content editing. Did you think about that for the GSAP website, for example? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, no, not you guys, no. <laughs> um, yes, that's a, that's a good question. Um, it doesn't have to I be think animated that GIFs. I, It's not like my approach to the world. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, not an anarchist. <laughs> um, and uh, it, I would say that it, it um, that was our approach. It was a solution to a problem and um, a problem of how to make the site dynamic and, um, and also an opportunity to take advantage of these particularly talented designers and artists. Um, I, I wouldn't go around um, applying that same solution to every problem, actually. Um, we, that way of thinking definitely influenced lots, like all the rest of our projects. And so, for example, the Whitney, which was like kind of our next big project, um, we approached that by saying all the staff at the Whitney basically should be able to edit the site. There too, there was no digital department at the time. 
And so we tried to make a system, a, a culture at the Whitney and a technical system that would allow different areas of the site to be built and maintained by different departments at the museum. We had like 50 different meetings with every different possible group at the museum. And so we did have a very uh, flat, decentralized approach to our client relationship. Um, and that tends to still be the case with the rest of our clients. Um, it was also at the Whitney a way of creating a sort of bottom-up pressure to turn them into a sort of like a digital institution. It led to them building a digital department eventually, and they did centralize a lot of that activity um, without really sort of reducing how dynamic the website is. So, um, and I think the other thing that we really learned from the art school site was not just about democracy, but was about um, change. And that's definitely a, a value that we've brought to all of our projects, including GSAP, um, that a site is an organism and a culture that's gonna unfold over time. Um, GSAP does have quite a lot of editors, actually, like 65 or something like that. Uh, people have worked in the site. Um, and uh, so, you know, but it also has a very capable communications department. Um, we're looking now at creating sort of special areas of the site for students. Um, and I think we would definitely think about like that students could edit their own pages, which would be public. Um, uh, and, you know, could submit their own student work. That's, some, that's stuff that's sort of always been like a possible phase of the project. Um, but there isn't really, you know, or maybe could submit events for like for student events, which is a pretty rich part of the fabric at GSAP and, and at Yale's architecture school, like student groups. Um, but uh, there basically isn't a need for students to edit the homepage at GSAP or to populate the site because like Jesse does it. <laughs> Um, as, a, as a fan of the studio and the work that your studio produces um, and, you know, having sort of tracked your, your body of work for, you know, over a decade now, I feel like when you come up with a new project, we can sort of understand that it's from Link by Air, it's made by Link by Air, and it's, it's hard to quantify, but, you know, a lot of it has to do with the fact this kind of idea of change, constant change, right? This is like this thing that's a little bit hard to pin down, a little bit slippery, which is part of the, the DNA of the... The, the websites that you produce. Um, but, you know, and I think that aspect or that sort of um, quality is quite apparent, at least for me as a, as a designer. But I was wondering, does the studio have uh, a stance or what, what is the relationship to style as in visual style? Um, I just want to say one more thing about Ken's question, and, I, and I also, that's also a great question. Um, the other thing about the School of Art site was that we were members of that community. And so I don't want to sort of downplay the idea of democracy either. Um, one sort of wrinkle, one thing, I, one anecdote I like to tell is that we were initially opposed to giving undergrads access to the School of Arts site, ability to edit it, because they didn't physically live in those studios in a way they didn't have physical, a physical stake in the building. And um, we, we weren't sure that they were sort of a, a part of the community in the sense that they, um, that they shared the same interests, basically, as the school. So sort of thinking about culture, I think, is something that we really learned from that site. Um, not just that like everybody can edit it and it will automatically be better, but that the site is a representation of an organization's culture and is able to, to, to be a window onto it. Um, and also can improve the culture of an organization as well. And so I think like the campus screens at GSAP are sort of part of that in a sense are part of thinking about GSAP as a culture um, that we're kind of contributing to and feeding back into as well as um, building off of. Um, in terms of visual style, um, yeah, I mean, I think people do, I don't know, people, I, I hear both ways actually. I think I mean, people do sort of I, you know, identify link by air sites visually as well. Um, some of it might be structural, like, um, it, you know, at least for a while when sites were built with economy, you could tend to be able to see, like, the seams between the modules a little bit, like, you could really see that in the first version of the Whitney site. Um, and, uh, 
and I like that. I mean, that's that's also I think part of our value is values. Uh, an aspect of our values is that you can sort of see how a system works as a as a user of that system, um, and that might, and that's a little bit of an ethical idea in some sense. Uh, you know, a sort of political aesthetic idea, and um, that 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 does have probably a formal result that you can see that you know that that, that you sort of look at the site and you, and it doesn't have that much decoration in a way. Um, uh, um, you know, in other ways, I think that's something that has really been, so that, that sort of simplicity, like making a complicated system out of simple parts, that's a style idea as well as a procedural idea. Um, uh, in other ways, I think, you know, our style, get, of course, gets influenced by the designers that that work with us and um, uh, who in turn are influenced by, you know, the designers that came before them and they're there right now and by, and by Tamara and I. Um, so I think as far as like advice or something, um, you know, I don't think you need to have like a visual style to say that you have a visual style, but I think, you know, that you have an approach to design that you know that you can that that cast a shadow and the shadow is your visual style um, is, is probably a good idea that you have you have an approach to design and that approach has some linkage with the form that you're making. Um, I think that's a good approach for designers and 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 uh, of all kinds. Um, uh, and that your approach is like connect to your value system in some way. Um, uh, whether it's you know being democratic or um, you know realizing that that you're not making monuments, you're making cultures, um, uh, uh, I think that's important to having a sort of sustainable practice that you can feel good about, and then we'll add something good to the world. Um, uh, but yeah, but you don't really have one without the other. I think. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks for your time, Danny.